introduction. Um, all right, so welcome everyone. Uh, my, my name is Daphne, as you probably already know by now, and I will introduce you to FNIRS for this coming hour. Um, so what will we be talking about? First, I'll briefly uh, introduce the theory of NIRS. How does it work exactly? Um, what, what, what sort of, of theories do we use here? Um, then I'll move on to the application that is FNIRS. Um, what is it exactly? Uh, we'll also compare it to some other modalities, such as EEG or fMRI. Um, then we'll have a short break for some questions. Um, I'll move on to how do you use FNIR, so I'll explain a little bit about these systems, um, about the setup that you can use, uh, about the different protocols that you can use, and finally we'll end with some information on the signals and the analysis, um, after which we'll have some time for questions during the Q&A. All right, let's jump right into it. So what is NIRS exactly? So with NIRS, we measure changes in light absorption in a volume of tissue. Um, and with these changes in light absorption, we can calculate the changes in concentration of oxygenated and deoxygenated hem hemoglobin. Um, so let's talk a bit more about this near infrared light that we're using. Um, so with near infrared light, I mean light with a wavelength between 700 and 900 nanometers. So if we take a look at the broader spectrum, uh, of, of wavelengths, um, it's around this area right here. So as we mentioned, we can use this to calculate the concentration changes of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Um, why is this possible? Because uh, these molecules absorb light in a near infrared spectrum. Um, so actually, if we would uh, use wavelengths that are lower than 700 nanometers, then the, our biological tissue would be the main absorber. If we would use higher wavelengths than 900 nanometers, then actually water will become the main absorber. And we can see that in this graph right here as well, uh, with the wavelength on the x-axis and the absorption coefficient on the y-axis. You can see that water here in yellow actually rises uh, a whole lot in its absorption coefficient after the 900 nanometers. Um, and here in red, we can see uh, oxyhemoglobin and in blue, deoxyhemoglobin. Um, and these black vertical lines represent the wavelengths that we use in our devices. So we chose these particular wavelengths because they give us the best resolution um, that we can use uh, for, uh, to make it possible for us to disentangle the concentration change of both molecules separately. All right, so um, we transmit light into biological tissue. Um, part of this transmitted light either scatters and some of it is absorbed. Um, so we, what we actually measure is the light that scatters back to the surface of the skin. Um, so light travels in a particular way, we, we know about this, and then we can estimate how much light we would receive back um, from the skin. However, there's a difference between uh, this estimation and what we actually receive back because light is also absorbed. Light is attenuated. So um, we call the transmitter, so that which transmits the light into the skin, and the receiver, um, that which receives the light back from the skin, we call these optodes. And of course, uh, this light scatters around in this tissue um, so actually, you measure about a volume, and the depth at which you measure is around half of the interopto distance. So that means the distance between these two optodes, between the transmitter and the receiver. Um, because it scatters all around, and you measure a particular volume, you can also uh, you also measure the effect of the skin and the skull right here. And I'll get back to that later. So let's. Um, let's get more into what you actually measure and how you then get these concentration changes. So what we measure is a change in optical density. And that's actually the, the light absorption uh, that we've talked about earlier. And using the modified Lambert-Beer law, we can calculate the change uh, of concentration of oxyhemoglobin 
and the change concentration of deoxyhemoglobin. Um, now I'll talk a bit about this modified Lambert beer law. Some of you might know it already, some of you might not, so I'll go briefly over what, what each of these uh, symbols mean. So first here we have delta OD. So this is the change in optical densities. Um, and this also depends on the wavelength, so you calculate it per wavelength, uh, which is what this uh, lambda here means. Then here we have the extinction coefficient. Um, so this is a constant for both oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, also per wavelength. The delta C, which is the change in concentration, that which we're actually looking to, to calculate uh, from this uh, modified lambert beer law. And here we have the physical path length. The physical path length um, is the interopto distance. So with most of our devices, uh, the interopto distance that we use is 30 millimeters. So in, in this case, um, the physical path length would be 30 millimeters times the DPF. Um, so this is called the differential path length factor. And the differential path length factor uh, actually accounts for the scattering um, that the light does. So what we actually want to know is um, what length does the light exactly travel uh, before it comes back to the receiver. Um, so actually this, uh, this DPF depends on the type of tissue as well as the age. For the brain, this is usually around six. So the light travels about six more times um, of the physical path length than if it would not scatter. All right, so that's, that's a, the modified lambert beer law in short. Um, now let's move on to what is it actually used for? Um, so here I've summarized a few examples of what NIRS can be used for. Um, we'll keep it short, for example, muscle physiology, brain physiology as well, um, but lots of other, lots of other organs, uh, the liver, the kidney, the heart, um, also food research, you can also do with NIRS, but uh, for today we'll focus mainly on FNIRS. So when I talk about FNIRS, um, it's mainly used for neuro, neuro re rehabilitation, neuromarketing, neurology, neuroscience, psychology, and computer interfaces. There are lots uh, and lots of applications also within, uh, within FNIRS. So let's talk about the, the definition um, of FNIRS now. So FNIRS stands for Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. So we're still measuring the concentration changes of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Um, but now we're actually looking into that those changes can reflect changes in brain activity. Um, and these changes are, uh, are most likely to be local. So actually you would use multiple channels um, in one area of the brain and these, these activation, uh, activation that you're looking for would actually be uh, in a few channels that you're measuring from. So let's, let's think of an example. Um, for example, you would be finger tapping. So when I'm finger tapping, do something, something like this. And I expect um, the finger area of my motor cortex to, to become active because I'm, I'm, I'm moving my fingers. Um, so let's, um, let's say that we're measuring the motor cortex. We're also measuring the, the finger area there. Um, and I would like to make this a bit interactive, so I would like you to use the raise hand function. I'm going to say a statement, and if you think it's true, I would like you to raise your hand. So if I'm measuring the motor cortex and I'm doing a finger tapping task, would in the finger area, would oxyhemoglobin increase? Who thinks it's true? Who thinks oxyhemoglobin increases? I'll give you a bit of time to respond. All right, well, it's true. Oxymoglobin does indeed increase. So if we look at this graph over here, uh, we can see time on the x-axis um, and the concentration changes on the y-axis. And we see that if you finger tap 
if you start finger tapping around this vertical line here, we can see an increase of oxyhemoglobin. And if we stop, it goes back to a baseline. Now I will explain why, why this is. So let's talk about the general shape that we expect with the brain activation. So at first, um, you, would, you, you would be in a resting state. So that means that, that the concentration um, or that, the, that your brain won't be active, it will be in a baseline. So that's what we mean by uh, having your relative concentration on zero. Then if you would uh, start a task uh, and your brain becomes active, then actually oxyhemoglobin rises in the span of about five to seven seconds. Um, while deoxyhemoglobin actually decreases a little bit, it might not, uh, but it might decrease a little bit also over the span of these seven seconds. Then if you would stop with, with finger tapping, for example, then you would actually, um, it would actually decrease back to the baseline um, over, over a time of around 10 seconds. So why, why does it happen exactly? Um, because the brain does consume oxygen um, when it's active, but actually um, there's also an increase in meta uh, metabolic demand. So the brain really um, needs some of the other nutrients that are in the blood. Uh, our body knows this, our body would like our brain to have these nutrients um, as soon as it needs it in order to, for it to stay active if it's necessary. So we have developed uh, a mechanism called neurovascular coupling. So as soon as the brain becomes active, this mechanism kicks in and it sends more blood to, the, to this brain area. So the cerebral blood flow increases, the blood volume increases, and then as a net outcome, what we actually have is an increase in oxyhemoglobin and a slightly smaller decrease in deoxyhemoglobin. So now that we know um, what FNIRS encompasses and how it works, what we, what we should expect the signal to look like, let's compare it to some other modalities. So um, you can see a graph right here. It has spatial resolution on the x-axis, a temporal resolution on the y-axis, and degree of mobility on the z-axis. Um, you can see FNIRS in yellow here, and I won't discuss um, every single one of these. I won't compare them all but I would like to, uh, to talk briefly about EEG and, and fMRI, which I think are the most, the most used uh, modalities. So let's compare it to, to EEG. So EEG um, is based on the electrical activity of neurons. And as you can see here in this graph, the temporal resolution is higher than that of FNIRS because uh, of course the electrical activity is, is much faster um, than this hemodynamic response that, that we've seen takes takes a few seconds to actually show. Um, but in terms of spatial resolution, actually what you see is that FNIRS um, has a higher spatial resolution. Um, what's also the case actually is that EEG is quite a bit more sensitive to, to artifacts, uh, to motion artifacts, and there's a lower signal to noise ratio than FNIRS. Um, then let's compare it to, to fMRI. As you can see, the spatial resolution of MRI um, is a bit higher, but actually these so fMRI and FNIRS are based on the same hemodynamic response. Um, so I would say um, that the, the spatial, and resolution, spatial and temporal resolution should be around the same, um, the same setting, but uh, it's measured in a completely different way. So this is actually what, what separates the two, um, the two measurement techniques. So one other, advantage is, uh, one, one other advantage of fMRI is that um, it's unlimited in depth. You can measure deeper brain structures, whereas with, with FNIRS, you can, actually, um, you can actually only measure the neocortex. But then a big advantage of FNIRS is that you can move around. In fMRI machine, you have to lie completely still, uh, whereas with FNIRS, you can actually move, it's quite portable, um, so there's no restrictions uh, in that area. And fMRI is also uh, quite a bit more expensive than, than FNIRS. So if what you want to do is also possible with FNIRS, this might be a nice, cheaper option. 
just to summarize some advantages um, is it's non-invasive wearable and wireless many different fields of application um, quite easy to use and uh, it is um, it's quite compatible with uh, a bunch of other modalities but there are also some things to take into consideration for example um, there you have to keep in mind the hemodynamic delay uh, so as i mentioned it does take a few seconds um, for, for this response to build up uh, so in order to have, have a nice signal, you need to be a little bit patient. Um, also, the hemodynamic response adds up. So if you present more stimuli that, uh, that follow up on each other uh, in a limited amount of time, you will actually see the, re uh, the hemodynamic response go up so you won't be able to distinguish between different stimuli. I'll also come back to this later. Um, as I mentioned, you cannot measure any deeper structure, so please keep that in mind that it's only possible to measure the neocortex. Um, and it's a relative measure, so you always need a baseline. Uh, since you measure concentration changes, um, you will also need to measure this brain area in its, in its resting state. But I would like to stress um, a few things as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, EEG has a high temporal resolution, but a low spatial resolution, whereas FNIRS has a high spatial resolution, but a low temporal resolution. And this is exactly um, why it might be a nice idea to combine the two to have the best of both worlds. Now, it's also possible, for example, to combine this with brain stimulation, um, such as trans transcranial current stimulation. Um, so th this might be something that's very uh, valuable to your research, for example. And if you're worried about uh, synchronization, um, because you do need to, 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 to synchronize if you're measuring with these, with these different modalities, um, we have lots of different options for that. Um, so don't worry about that. There's always something possible. So right now, um, I will start with, with, with the part of how you actually perform at NIRS. Um, and I'll start with, with, with giving you a bit of an idea of how the devices, uh, how devices work, how, what they look like, um, and what, what the difference is be between them. So first, the Oximum. Um, this is our only laser-based system. Uh, that means it has the most stable wavelengths. And actually, this system can create uh, from uh, one to up to uh, 112 channels. Um, and with this one, the sampling rate can go up to 250 hertz, which is higher than, than most other devices in case you need it. Then uh, I'd like to discuss the Optimum. So this is a um, wearable eight-channel LED system, which is especially designed for the prefrontal cortex. This one is uh, very, very, very comfortable. So it's mostly used with, with elderly and with children where, uh, where these um, yeah, these participants need to be comfortable uh, for a long time. Um, it's very easy to set up. Within five minutes, you're ready. Um, for this one, the sampling rate is 50 hertz. Around the same goes for Optimum Plus, um, also a wearable eight-channel LED device, but this one's optimized for measurements on the hair. So hair absorbs a lot of near infrared light. So these optodes, um, are actually made, made to, to do with that. So they, um, these LEDs send out a bit higher, uh, higher light intensity. Um, and these optodes are made so that you can move them out of the head cap and move the hair uh, actually to the side um, using these, these handy optodes and holders. Then the Bright 23. Um, so this is a wearable 23 channel device. Uh, which is especially made for the frontal cortex. Um, here again, these handy optodes in which you can move hair out of the side um, as well. The um, sampling rate for this one is 100 hertz. Then the Bright 24, um, wearable LED device with 20, uh, up to 27 channels actually. Um, and this one is also optimized for areas with hair. Um, so the, the transmitter sent out a little bit higher 
uh, light intensity to, to help with that. Um, and again, you can take the optodes out to move the hair aside. For this one, the sampling rate is 50 hertz as well. Um, and with this one, you can combine them. So you can combine two, write 24, uh, and actually create um, a device that can measure with 54 channels. We actually also developed um, this one for, for children as well. Um, if you're more interested uh, in, in, in any of other, um, uh, other, other devices or tips and tricks uh, for measuring with children, please have a look at the webinar next week uh, by, um, by Renata and, uh, and uh, Dr. Paula Pinti. Now that you have a bit of an idea um, what the devices look like, I would like to talk to you about the Opto template. So now would be the time to start thinking about what brain areas would I like to measure? Um, and what's really important with that is the optimal optode setup. So you can choose a template. Let's say, for example, you have a Bright24. Um, and one of the templates that's most used with this device is the 2 times 12 template. So here we see a, a one part of a template. So this is 12 channels made with five receivers and uh, or five transmitters and four receivers. So you can, you can create this template. Um, the distance between the optodes, again, is around 30 millimeters. Um, so you can cover quite, quite a large area with this. Then the next question is, where are you going to place it? Um, because you can actually place it all over. As you can see in our head cap, um, you can find many different, different spots where you, could, where you could place this template. Um, so what, yeah, what do you do then? Uh, my advice is, look at previous similar research. Look um, at the area that of, that of interest to them. Um, so actually, people rarely do all brain, um, all brain measurements because it does take a lot of time to set up everything. Uh, it, it also costs a lot of money uh, uh, yeah, to get those many, that many optodes. Um, and it's, most of the time, it's not necessary at all. You can, you can get perfectly, perfectly nice results um, if you focus on, on, on a few brain areas. So most of the time, that's, that's more beneficial. So look at previous similar research. Um, if they mention a brain area and you don't know exactly where it is on the head, um, you could use this software, Brain Tutor. It's, it's, it's free to download. Um, we use this link. We can also send it to you uh, in the email one day, one day after, after this webinar that you'll receive. Um, so you can, you can check it out if you want to know uh, a brain area um, and see where exactly uh, in the skull it would be. Um, one more thing uh, that, that you can check out if you're not sure, is use the 1020 system. So on our cap, we do have these, uh, uh, these 1020 locations uh, printed on there. Um, and you can use this paper, for example, in order to, to look up certain brain areas uh, and look up to which 1010 position, um, uh, with which 1010 position they're associated. All right. One more thing about uh, the placements. Um, head sizes can vary. And that means that if the opto template does not change with it, so remember the distances um, between the transmitter and the receiver should stay 30 millimeters, um, you cannot scale that up or down depending on the head size. So that means um, that you will measure a different surface uh, depending on the head size. Um, you can estimate what the surface is by using, uh, by using digitization. Um, so with the Polhemus, you can create a, a projection um, of your template on, uh, on a template brain um, that you can store in the software and, and actually um, estimate more accurately which uh, brain areas you're actually measuring. All right. Um, remember when I said that you also measure the skin and the skull? Uh, so this is where, uh, where I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, so the depth uh, at which you can measure is around the interruptive distance um, divided by two. So let's imagine that we have a transmitter and a receiver right here, 
and the, the interopto distance is 30 millimeters. So actually the light travels mostly through, um, through the neocortex here. Now, if we would place a shorter channel, um, so this, this channel actually has an interopto distance of 10 millimeters, then the light will travel, travel mostly through the skin and the skull. Um, now we could use this information to actually correct uh, for signals that we get from the more superficial layers. So let's look at some signals and see what the, what the difference is. Um, so here uh, we can see the time on the x-axis, the concentration changes on the y-axis, and we see in red um, oxyhemoglobin from a normal channel with a 30 millimeter distance and oxyhemoglobin from the shorter channel with 10 millimeter distance. Um, and we can see here in the vertical line is the stimulus onset. We can see that it does increase a little bit for the short channel where it increases more for the normal channel. Um, now you could, you could systematically subtract uh, the signals from each other. So let's look at some average data. So here on the top, we can see the normal channel we have in red oxyhemoglobin and in blue deoxyhemoglobin. Um, and we can see this is, this is quite a nice response, um, but the standard deviation is a, is a little, bit, uh, little bit bigger. And if we look at the short channel, we can see that indeed it does, it does increase, um, oxyhemoglobin does increase a little bit as well in the skin and the skull uh, at stimul stimulus onset. Um, this kind of, uh, multiple reasons we you might never know for sure it could be blushing um, it could be uh, breathing it could be blood pressure um, but the thing is um, if you systematically subtract them from each other uh, the difference would be something like this so you can see the signal is a little bit cleaner um, you might be able to estimate better the signal that you actually get from the brain activity um, and the standard deviation is a little bit smaller. All right, um, let's move on now to uh, the study design. So I've summarized the, the most used paradigms. Um, so the, the most used paradigm right now is the block design. Um, it's followed by the event related design, which is then followed by the mix design. Um, I will explain the block design and the event related design in a bit more detail and show an example of both. Um, and of the mix design, um, I'll just say that it's a, as the name implies, it's a mix of the block design uh, and event related design. So the block design um, uses blocks of repeated trials and stimuli, which are then alternated with resting and baseline periods. And these resting periods, um, these, uh, these should have everything that the task has as well, except for, uh, what, what you think brings activation to your, to your region of interest. Um, so there are a few, um, there are a few things to keep in mind when, when using a block design. Some pros are that it's, it's simple. Um, so you have just a resting block and a task block with repeated trials and, and stimuli. Um, so it's simple for both you um, and for your subject. Uh, so if not many mistakes can, can, can happen there, all the better. Um, also the signal is quite strong and reliable. So as you can see here, if you repeat many trials and stimuli over, over this course, um, the signal will increase quite a bit, uh, which will add power to, um, to your research. And some cons is that you cannot isolate the response to individual stimuli. Um, so if you're really interested in that, it might not, block design might not be um, the design for you, um, as it's also prone to confounds such as habituation and anticipation. Um, of course, you can imagine that uh, if you're a subject and the test control alternate each other at a set, um, at set time points, um, you might be able to anticipate when, when the next uh, task block starts. I would like to take a look with you um, at this little video. So this is what our, our software looks like. 
Um, to the left, you can see uh, your measurements and graphs. On the top bar, you can see the traces of oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, and total hemoglobin of a single channel. And here we have the topograph uh, below of the oxyhemoglobin changes. And we're going to look a little bit at the signal. So at the vertical lines that we see on the top graph, um, there you might be able to, uh, so that's actually where the task starts. You might be able to see some activity, but it's not quite convincing. And there's also not really, uh, the baseline implementation is, is not there. So we cannot, we cannot really see uh, see anything um, that looks like uh, that looks like brain activity here. But um, let's have a look at the same signal, but then averaged and with a baseline implementation. Um, so the task would start about now. The resting period in front that was uh, that was put to zero. We can see a nice activation of the finger area. So it's a finger tapping task. And now you can see it going back to a baseline as soon as um, this person stops finger tapping. So as you can see, it's quite a powerful response that you can get with, with uh, having the, the baseline um, and the task uh, combined to a block design. Now let's look at a similar signal, but um, now we can see the participant actually doing it. Um, so let's, let, let's have a look. This is uh, average data as well, so this is why you will get the strong response. So now you will start squeezing the ball. And you can see in the motor cortex that actually oxyhemoglobin increases. And when he stops, um, it will go back to a baseline again. Of course, again, it takes a little bit of time. So you have to, you have to be a little bit patient. And there we can see it going back to a baseline. All right. I would like to discuss one example. Um, so this is a paper that shows that music improves verbal memory and coding while decreasing prefrontal cortex activity. Um, so they measured a few young students. They did some memory and coding, um, either when, when playing some music um, or uh, when it was silent. So actually one block consists of a context, um, then a context with, with some words that they had to remember, and then they could see the context a bit longer. And they had eight channels over the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And then afterwards, um, they, they had to recall uh, the words once more during the retrieval phase. So let's see, um, let's see what actually happened with the, with the brain activity here. Um, so here you can see the time on the x-axis and the concentration change on the y-axis in red oxyhemoglobin, in blue deoxyhemoglobin. And during the music encoding, there's not much going on. Um, so the prefrontal is not really doing anything right, right here, it seems like. Um, while doing the silence encoding, you can see a big increase in oxyhemoglobin and a little bit of a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin. So here there, there is uh, some prefrontal activity going on. But what's interesting um, here is they had improved uh, for all memory encoding. So they remembered a lot more words during the music encoding than during the silence encoding. So it might, it might cost you less effort, um, but you could remember more. Let's talk about the event-related design. So here, um, it means you present individual trials and stimuli uh, that you can present at any time. So it's random. Um, at any time that you're measuring, you could present uh, a stimulus or, or a trial. Um, now, one, uh, one term that's used here very often is the interstimulus interval, which can be short, long, or jittered. Um, and by short, what, what that means is that they, would, uh, they could overlap, as you can see here, where you have two trials that are quite close together. And since the human network response does take a bit of time to go back to baseline, um, they can overlap. Now here it can be, um, you can have a long interstimulus interval, which there's a longer resting period, but you will be able to see um, the response to one single uh, stimuli. 
And jittered, of course, is that you use these, these two um, both uh, in one session. So there are again some pros and some cons. Um, a few pros is that you can uh, isolate um, the response to individual uh, stimuli with this one. Um, it can also disentangle the task or, or attention related confounds that you, um, that you could not disentangle during the block design. However, um, the response is a bit weaker compared to the block design because you only show uh, one stimulus. Um, so it, it won't be such a strong response. Um, also, if you use a short interstimulus interval, the responses can overlap, um, which during which you might have a harder time uh, seeing the responses to individual stimuli. Um, but it can also be time inefficient if you use a long interstimulus interval since you have to wait, uh, wait a long time um, in order to show the next uh, stimuli. One example um, of event-related task design uh, is this one. So this, uh, this one is called Changes in Oxygenated Hemoglobin Link Freezing of Gate to Frontal Activation in Patients with Parkinson's Disease. Um, so these patients, um, they would sometimes display freeze of gait, uh, where they more or less freeze in their place, despite their intention to actually keep on walking. Um, so here they were instructed to walk, uh, either in circles or, or, or in eights. Um, and then during a random moment in time, they were instructed to turn, uh, to actually turn around. Um, so during this turn, sometimes they could display freeze of gait, and sometimes uh, they would not. Um, and also they were uh, measuring ichneres on the anterior prefrontal cortex here. So let's have a look at, um, at the results. So here uh, on the y-axis is oxyhemoglobin. Um, so you can actually see that during the trials that they displayed the freeze of gait uh, while turning, um, actually before they displayed the freeze of gait, there was a big increase in oxyhemoglobin. Um, and then compared to, to, to this result, um, when they actually did turn without the freeze of gait, uh, you would see during the turn, that oxyhemoglobin would decrease. So this is one example um, of an event related task design. I would like to go over some frequently asked questions um, that we get often. One of those is how many stimuli uh, should I use? How many, how many should, I, should I present? Um, so of course, this is, this is uh, very dependent on, on your research. Um, on the on on the power um, of of your effect, but it should be enough to maximize the signal to noise ratio. Um, but it should be uh, not too much so that you can avoid habituation effects. The next question um, we often get is how do I avoid um, the compound of uh, of physiological oscillations? Um, so there are a lot of um, a lot of, of a lot of visual signals that can actually sync up with the stimulus onset, uh, and one one thing you can do to avoid that is to jitter um, the the stimulus onset. So also with the block design, you can introduce um, a little bit of a random a randomized uh, period, for example, uh, one to five seconds, and that will be randomized in order to to do introduce a little bit of, of randomness to the onset um, of your stimuli. But of course, if you really um, don't want uh, any, any, any physical or, or a physiological oscillation to be present in your signal, you should use the event-related design. Um, the next one is the order of presentation. So actually, um, if you use multiple conditions, uh, you should think about your trial sequence. Um, so when when do you want to measure uh, your, your baseline exactly? Um, 
And you maybe you can think about um, having multiple testing sessions in order to avoid uh, this, this habituation in case you have um, a lot of conditions uh, that you would like to, to test out. All right. Um, I would like to show you what a good signal looks like. Um, so sometimes um, you'll see things in your signal that you might not be interested in at all. For example, the heartbeat. Um, but actually, this can tell you a lot about the quality of your signal because it does tell you um, if you're actually measuring oxy or the oxyhemoglobin. So we expect is in oxyhemoglobin, so also here in red, that you can see a nice clear heartbeat. Um, since most of the time it comes from the heart, uh, so you would still have the heartbeat visible um, in the signal, since also um, in the veins. But in deoxyhemoglobin, um, since it does come from, from other areas and it's uh, most likely on, a, on its way to the heart, um, you could see, uh, sometimes you can see a little bit of a heartbeat, but sometimes um, also none at all. So this is, this will be um, the optimal signal that you can see while you're measuring uh, FNIRs. Let's have a bit of a look into the signal components. So here, um, in this graph, you can see time on the x-axis and concentration changes on the y-axis. And also have a graph here to the side um, with the frequency on the x-axis and the power on the y-axis. So this is a graph uh, based on frequency um, that has been calculated by a, a, a Fourier transformation. So I would like to discuss um, what components you have in your FNIR signal um, based on, on the frequency that they're in. And we're going to start with the hemodynamic signal. So this is actually uh, what you're interested in when you're measuring FNIRs. Um, it's quite slow, so you can see it in this graph in black, as well as here. Then the next one is vessel-motion effects, um, so, the, so, the, so the, the blood pressure-related effects. Um, these are in this frequency, and you can see them here in green. There are many waves in gray around this area. Sometimes they can also be on a little bit lower frequency. It, uh, it usually depends um, a lot on the situation. Respiration, we can see here in blue. So this is breathing, um, which is usually around this frequency band. And you can see it also uh, in this graph in blue. And then the heartbeat, uh, the cardiac cycle in red here. So this is the, the quickest um, signal that you'll measure with, with FNIRs. So let's summarize. You have some physiological artifacts, um, which can be mirror waves, breathing, heartbeat, um, also blood pressure related effects, and some extrinsic sources of artifacts such as um, the sensor movement, um, which, which can create a big artifact to make sure that your head cap is nice and tight. Um, some environmental light, um, so if, if there are lots of flashes, lots of sunlight, this might also interfere. And as somebody already asked the question about it as well, um, other optical equipment that operates in the near infrared light spectrum, especially if they're using the same wavelengths, um, then it might be a problem. But you could always just shield them from the from the light. You can also test it in our software if it's interfering. Um, so there are lots of things you can do about it. Finally, um, I'll talk a little bit about the analysis options that, that, that you have when you're working with FNIRs. So they can be analyzed by three different paths, main paths. Um, first of all, OxySoft, our software, offers a variety of standard analysis techniques. Um, so you can, uh, you can apply filters, you can calculate averages um, and uh, other, uh, other standard numbers such as standard deviation, uh, minimum or maximum values. And you can also uh, apply uh, some standard statistics to your data. Um, next. You can also export to many different other formats, including text or Excel. 
And I think this is the most used one. Um, we developed a tool to convert your axis of data uh, so that you can use um, some free MATLAB toolboxes such as Homer, here's SPM, or Filter. All right, this was the end of my talk. Thank you all very much, and let's move on to the Q&A.